Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Taylor and I teach third grade in Central California. Today, I'm just going to be word vomiting about what is going on for this next school year. I am still not completely sure what's going on and I normally try not to think about my school year during summer. I need that time just to take care of myself. So I try to not think about school until August 1st. August 1st, pedal to the metal, I'm all about school and preparing. But this year's different, this is a totally different case. And I've been pretty good about not stressing myself out about it because quite frankly, everything is just so up in the air. There's no point on getting really mad about one plan when it's just gonna change next week and it's gonna go back and forth. I wanna know the final plan and then I can take a head on and handle it however I need to. But with that being said, I had an Instagram live with Skylar over from The Heart in Teaching and it went amazing, but it really got me thinking about this school year. She asked a lot of really good questions, things that are gonna be the same, things are gonna be different, and what I plan on doing. And I figured I would come on here and basically share those thoughts with you. So first of all, I got an email of a semi plan for next year, but I guess my district is still voting like at the end of the month on something. I'm not sure, but as of right now, from the emails, we are going to do the hybrid model. And I have mixed feelings about this. So part of me is excited that I get to physically see my kids because I can't help but feel my kids need me. If I can be that person in their life to help them through this, I'm a fixer, I'm a helper. So that's just my role. That's how I feel. Like. So part of me is happy to go back to the classroom. But then the other part of me is just like, I'm gonna get it. So. So I'm gonna get it. There's there's no way around this. I'm gonna get it. And here's the thing, like hypothetically, I'm young, I'm healthy. If I get it, then I just get a mild case of it. And if that's the case, I, I'm fine going back. But there's a lot of teachers who aren't young and healthy, who have underlying issues, who live with someone who's immune compromised, who is at risk. And asking someone to go into work to get sick and then most likely bring it home to their friends or family to get sick, that's a much bigger issue. Hi, Editing Taylor here. I just have to say real quick, the fact that this is even a question, that's it, okay, bye. And there's no way in saying if it's worth it or not until that happens. Like I said, if it's something to where I get it, but I hand, my body handles it okay and I'm fine, it's for the greater good, it was worth it to go back. If I get it and it's a terrible case or I pass it on to my parents and they have a bad case, not worth it, not worth it at all. But you never know until you're actually in it. And every county is different. I saw that one teacher posted one third of their community had passed away from this virus. And you cannot ask them to go back into school this early when we still don't know much about it. So I think that this is a very county by county, case by case thing that we are dealing with. And if there's any question or doubt, then it should be distance learning. Do I like distance learning? No, not at all. All right, editing today real quick. Again, I just want to say that I think the reason why I'm not super against this hybrid model is because I do feel like my district and my principal care. I know my principal is going to be on it with the cleaning supplies, sanitizing everything. She would do it herself if she has to, she's she's that way, she's amazing. So I think that does take a weight off my shoulders. I do feel seen and heard. They sent lots of surveys that I really appreciate to all of our teachers and admin, to the parents. So I feel like we are truly just doing what is best for our community and I know our community needs us and our schools to be open. So it is unfortunate that we're kind of up in the front lines, but I, I get it, you know, and I, I know they're all just doing what they think is best for the majority. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. So, got that off my chest. I'm not gonna lie, part of me was excited when I heard the hybrid because that will be in person. And just because distance learning was not effective at all with my kids. And I feel like if we just go into distance learning this year, done. Like this is not, this is not effective. Our kids aren't going to learn anything. We are letting our kids fall by the wayside. And not that I'm not, and not that because as teachers aren't providing material for our kids, aren't trying. Just the lack of the skills needed to be on this technology source and do all the things is not there with our community. And, okay getting into a bigger deal. So hybrid method. These are my thoughts on it. This is what's going down. So the game plan is I have a class. It is split in half. The first half comes Monday, Tuesday, while the other half is doing distance learning Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday 
all distance learning, all of it online. I'll still probably have to be in school because that's what my district does. But that's for a deep clean. Then Thursday, Friday, the other set of kids are coming in and those first set are doing distance learning there. So yes, double the work, but, but so yes, a lot of extra work. And so with this, I'm not going to try to make up for lost time, okay? I teach third grade. I'm getting full on second graders, okay? I'm not going to try to get them from second grade to fourth grade. That's too much, that's way too much stress and pressure on the kids and myself. Not going to happen. These kids have been through a lot. So mental, emotional health is going to take a priority above everything, okay? Like we will get to the standards. We are going to move up from where we were. As long as there's growth, I'm cool with that. And anyone should be cool with that. Growth above all else. So my focus is going to be making sure that they are mentally, emotionally okay. From there, building that relationship and then growing, making moves from where we are at. And everyone's going to be very different. So we're gonna have even more differentiation that is needed in our classroom. And that is where the smaller class sizes in this hybrid model can be actually a really good thing. So there is a chance here that this hybrid model can be really good. We have smaller class sizes, that means more one-on-one -on -one time. And for once, I hope that we are focusing on mental, emotional health above everything. Because knowing that the school year was cut in half, knowing that there was learning loss, and just working with what we got, making sure there's growth, being okay with that. So that is what I feel passionate about. And my main thing is going to be small groups and differentiation throughout in class and online. So first, the actual in class portion is going to look extremely different, but I would like to keep things as normal as possible. So first thing in the morning, I greet my students at the door, normally with a high five, a wave, a hug, a fist bump, come on. So that's not going to happen, but I still want to be able to do that in some other ways, respecting the distance. I'm still not comfortable with the elbow touching, to be honest, that's just me. But so I still wanna do something where we have like a face that we make to each other and like each student has a different face that we make or a little foot handshake. So we will kick each other's feet in a certain pattern or a certain like dance move or something. Totally cool with that. That's what I plan on implementing for that because I do think greeting your students first thing in the morning is super important to build that relationship critical during this time, especially being out of school for six months. We don't know what their home life has looked like. We need to come in really strong with building that relationship. Next, I normally do a morning meeting. So they grab their journals, they write for a little bit, and then we all come to the carpet, sit in a circle, and then we talk about stuff. And we pass around a little buddy stuffed animal as like the little speaker tool. And none of that, none of that could really happen. Throw away a stuffed animal, that's not gonna be able to happen. But I still think morning meetings are very important for us to build as a community in our classroom. So. So I guess the only option is for them to sit on their desk. So if we can all just sit on our desk in the morning and have a conversation about regular morning meeting stuff. That's morning meeting plan, still working on it. And this is just going to be a figure it out as we go, which I'm cool with. That tends to be how I learn things. <laughs> Moving into ELA. So ELA, of course we have groups reading, right? I also like to do silent reading where we have 10 to 20 minutes a day to stop and read. And normally they get to pick any part in the room. But now we're gonna have to be very specific about that. So most likely it's gonna be, you have the choice to sit on top of your desk, in your seat or under your desk. So they still have a choice, but it's not open to the whole room. And I think that is super important. Major goals in third grade are of course, mastering that reading and math strategies. So we are going to be doing a lot of reading. I also want to use the website Seesaw because it allows kids to record their voice so they can record themselves reading. They can go and send that to a classmate and then they'll read the second chapter, that sort of stuff to where they're taking turns reading as if they are reading with a buddy. And since it's a little techie way, it might be more fun. It might be a fun twist on it. So, so I want to keep kids collaborating as much as possible. And with this website, I can also hear it. So it's like, hey, we're gonna read high frequency words, uh, read dry frequency words on Seesaw, email it to me. Or read the story on Seesaw, email it to me. And if that's part of workshop where they're doing that and I actually have one, maybe two kids at my small group table to work on individual needs, then that's something that is going to be very effective. So that is kind of my game plan for reading, just small game plan. Uh, with that, the library. So library is going to be, of course, an issue. And I am thinking, because they can't just go to the library and pick books and I can be able to go to my classroom library because they're touching everything and germs. So I'm thinking of doing like 
personal bins. So each note will have like a personal bin with like three to five library books that they get to pick and probably have like two that are in their AR level and then two that are just random whenever they feel like reading. And those will go in their little basket. With that is where I'll put another little box or baggie, whatever, of their supplies that they'll need for the day. That'll include worksheets we're doing, textbooks, and just the daily supplies are gonna be in that little bins. So when they first get there, they'll grab their bins, they'll go sit down and they have everything they need. But main point of this was the library. So library, they pick three to five books and then that way they can rotate, they can test on those books and it should last them at least a week. From there, it's going to be me disinfecting these books and setting them aside for 14 days. So sorry, but those books aren't gonna be accessible for 14 days, just for safety reasons. So they'll be able to shop again in my library and pick another set of books. So there should be like a rotating, revolving door of library books, but definitely have it set aside, disinfected, and sit in there for 14 days and try to get it in the most sun as possible, I think, without damaging the books. Again, still a work in progress, still learning. But that's my game plan for library. For math, I like to use a lot of manipulatives because that is the only way that kids really grasp these strategies. So I'm thinking I'm just gonna cut out a lot of paper materials, paper manipulatives. So I'll cut out the little block tens, the block ones, laminate them so they're actually a little more sturdy and have them in baggies. And again, if I can just have like a class set of those and make sure Nope, that's not gonna work. They need to be disinfected or belong to one student. So these manipulatives are going to be in like their pencil pouch most likely and we're gonna, and I'm not getting crazy doing a bunch of different types of manipulatives. I really wanna have it be one or two manipulatives that we just use consistently. Moving into workshop. So I'm, I don't really do centers till the end of the year. So that's not gonna be too hard for me to cut, but for workshop, it's definitely going to be a situation to where they have like a workshop binder or folder and that's going to have the worksheets and materials that they need. And also a big portion of workshop is going to be online and having them using those online materials, find websites, might do Bitmoji Classroom to where they can do that, to where workshop can be done in the classroom and online for my distance learning kids and that will be pretty much the same. Oh, as far as worksheets, I don't want, I don't like just a bunch of worksheets. It feels like busy work, but I loved how that special educator said that she actually just does a class set and she laminates and makes it a Velcro activity. And because they're laminated, you can get an Expo marker and the kids can actually work it out on their worksheet and then Velcro the correct answers where they belong. And from there, I can just kind of check it and it can be reused. So that way, once kids have mastered that skill, they're not gonna have to do that skill again. They'll grab a different worksheet and practice different things. So pretty much, class set of worksheets that are gonna be laminated and try to do the Velcro thing as much as possible to make it more engaging and interactive. I also love the mini anchor charts from that stellar teacher. Over on Teachers Pay Teachers, definitely go check her out. I love to have my kids notebooks where they can have a place for all their mini anchor charts. They're glued in and that way they can refer to them at any time they need, whether that is in the classroom or at home for distance learning. So go check out that stellar teacher company. It'll be in the link in the description down below. So now here is where the hybrid distance learning kind of takes place. I really wanna focus on doing project-based learning. So not necessarily have in-class going on and a full different online learning thing going on. It was not successful to be teaching new concepts on distance learning in my experience for my kiddos. So I don't think that that's a strong point for us. I, if I have them for two days, I want to teach a new concept. I want us to practice it. And then when they have the two days that are distance learning, that's where I want them to do the independent version of that. So when I teach in my classroom, it is always, I do, we do, you do. So the I do, we do is going to be in class. And then the you do is going to be at home. But you will have resources that I provide on distance learning to help you. So if you need to refer back to the I do or the we do, you can have that at home as well. For example, if we're reading and writing, we're gonna be reading a story in class, we're gonna be working on the base of the writing, and then when you go home for distance learning, that's when I expect, okay, now we're typing this up in a Google Docs, we're revising it, we might edit it together through Google Docs, and then you're going to submit that work. So that is your independent work that you've done. So that is my, that's my focus. I think that's going to be really strong for my kiddos because a big thing that I have an issue with in class is I help too I help too much. I hold her hand for a little too long. So this really forces both of us to focus on independent work. And I think I think this can be good, guys. I really do. And then of course Wednesday will be like a combined lesson for all. And of course I will always have spelling, vocabulary, and review stuff on the distance learning website. I still haven't 
I'm still not completely sure how I'm gonna go about it. I feel Google Slides is the most simple, but I'm also afraid with my third graders that it's gonna be too simple and they're gonna get bored. I love Nearpod and really like to do that and that you can also implement your Google Slides, but I don't think my district will really support that. I don't know if they have to pay money or just approve it, but I feel like it's an extra step I don't want to bug them with it and I just don't, I don't think it'll work. So therefore Nearpod, even though it's super engaging and I love it, uh, I think it's going to end up being more of a hassle down the road. So Google Slides, I'm thinking of attempting that Bitmoji Classroom. I think that's what's going to step it up for third graders to be more engaging. I have not started making that. So I don't really know what that experience is like. I'm sure I will film it down the road and then let you know. But there's a lot of really great resources on it on Teachers Pay Teachers or on YouTube. So I also really liked Prezi, uh, but again, Prezi, I feel like it's not engaging enough. Like it, it's moving, but they don't interact with it like they do in Nearpod and that's what I really like. And same for Bitmoji Classroom. The kids are actually interacting with it. And what I love about Bitmoji Classroom is that it is basically a virtual classroom. So even though I cannot provide that same classroom feel, in person, I'm able to hopefully do that online to where they can feel like they can click on me and hear me and hear and watch me read a story. They can click on the library and it could take them to my on or whatever it is that they're actually reading other stories or they're reading. Uh, same with math. I can, there can be a little game piece with games that they can click on and have a choice of educational games to help them with whatever we're learning. Oh, real quick. Okay. So virtual teaching, as far as Zoom calls go, I am not. I am not gonna try to have all 27 students on at the same time. I don't see how that's gonna be effective. I don't see it. Uh, if you do, enlighten me, comment down below, but I don't see it. So I'm going to, like I said, focus on differentiation and small groups. So I am going to focus more on having small group Zooms. So I can group students with their needs. We can Zoom, talk about those certain things. But the thing is, it's not going to be these five students only see these five students. Okay, just because someone is in this group for ELA and math, they're gonna be in a different group. And it's always going to be rotating and switching up because there always needs to be that heterogeneous mix. But I really would like to take this time to focus on a more homogeneous mix for those foundational lessons that need to be retaught. And with virtual learning and in class kind of, simplicity. Simplicity is key. Now is not the time to be trying to accomplish a bunch of stuff at once. We don't need the extra stress. Our kids definitely don't need the extra stress and our students and families don't need that extra stress. So just simplify. Don't be afraid to cut a lesson in half if you need to, just like we would in class. If a lesson's not working or we expected our kids to kind of get this because we've gone over it before and they're not getting it, cut it in half. Really focus on mastering the foundation before going on with the lesson just because you wanted to get the lesson done today. No, no, same for distance learning. If they're not getting it, take the time to go over that because there has been learning loss. Take the time to review, have patience, and that goes for everyone. Teachers have patience, students, please have patience with us. We don't know what we're doing. And parents, please have patience for your kiddos and for us teachers, because none of us expected a pandemic and none of us know what we're doing. So if we could just have patience and grace and kindness, that would be much appreciated. So that's my game plan. And I'll keep you posted on what other changes may come. And again, once August 1st hits, I will dive more into the actual teaching stuff, preparing for next year. But as of right now, I'm going to enjoy the last nine, 10 days of July and embrace summer. So that is all I have for today. Please give this video a big thumbs up if you liked it. Feel free to comment down below your thoughts, opinions, concerns, kindness, any of that. And I'll see you guys next week. Bye guys.